Anon's Childhood Story Eight years old and home by myself. Grandma's out on a date. Watching Pokemon in my living room, I start to hear a tapping on the window. I look through the window and see a man. I back up. He breaks the window. I drop all my Pokemon cards I was holding and leave the house as fast as possible. I run to my great-grandpa's house four houses down from ours. I tell him exactly what happened. He calls the police and we go back home. The man is gone. The police find something among all the cards I dropped. I hand it to my great-grandpa and he begins to tear up a bit and hugs me. My grandma finally comes home and we tell her what happened. My great-grandpa shows her what the police found. She turns pale and hugs me. The next day, she replaces the window and has them put special latches on them in the doors as well. A few years pass and I finally work up the courage to ask what they found. Grandma shows me. It's a picture from the inside of my closet at night. You can see me sleeping in the photo. The date is from two days before he broke the window. One school day, a boy named Tom was sitting in class and doing math. It was six more minutes until school let out. As he was doing his homework, something caught his eye. His desk was next to the window, and he turned and looked to the grass outside. It looked like a picture. When school was over, he ran to the spot where he saw it. He ran fast so that no one else could grab it. He picked it up and smiled. It had a picture of the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She had a dress with tights on and red shoes, and her hand was formed into a peace sign. She was so beautiful he wanted to meet her, so he ran all over the school and asked everyone if they knew her or have ever seen her before, but everyone he asked just said no. He was devastated. When he was home, he asked his older sister if she knew the girl, but unfortunately she also said no. It was very late, so Tom walked up the stairs, placed the picture on his bedside table, and went to sleep. In the middle of the night, Tom was awakened by a tap on his window. It was like a nail tapping. He got scared. After the tapping, he heard a giggle. He saw a shadow near his window, so he got out of his bed, walked toward the window, opened it up, and followed the giggling. By the time he reached it, it was gone. The next day again, he asked his neighbors if they knew her. Everybody said, sorry, no. When his mother came home, he even asked her if she knew her. She said no. He went to his room, placed a picture on his desk, and fell back asleep. Once again, he was awakened by a tapping. He took the picture and followed the giggling. He walked across the road when he was suddenly hit by a car. He died instantly, picture in hand. The driver got out of the car and tried to help him, but it was too late. He saw the picture and picked it up. He saw a cute girl holding up three fingers. Anon's Tire Bursts Be six years ago, on my way home from the movies. Bad storm that night, rainy and windy as usual. Swerve to avoid a fallen tree branch, just barely clip it with the rear left tire. Tire blows. Pull over and turn on the hazard lights. Get out to inspect the damage. Raining so hard, it feels like I'm at a water park under one of those huge dump buckets. I open the trunk. The spare is flat. No cell phone because I live in this redneck-ass area with no reception. I see a house with a couple of lights on about a mile down the road and start walking. The house looks as old as Abe Lincoln, but not too creepy because, as I said, the area was redneck as hell and most houses are old as shit. I knock on the door and a little old lady answers. I tell her about my car trouble and ask her if I can use her phone. She points me to the kitchen. I pick up the phone and call for a tow. I hang up the phone and then receive the best hot chocolate of my life from the old lady. I see the tow truck drive past the house towards the car about a half an hour later. I thank the old lady and say goodbye. Then I walk down the road to my car. The car gets hooked up and the tow truck guy drives me and my crippled car home. I get the tire and the spare replaced first thing the next morning. I decide to go back and thank the old lady again. Where the fuck did the house go? I'm pretty sure I'm in the right spot. 
Uh, there's nothing but an old stone chimney there. No walls, no foundation, no wood, nothing but a damn chimney. And one of those historic landmark signs. Evidently, the house that was in that spot was an old bed and breakfast for travelers. According to the landmark sign, it burnt down in 1927. The bed and breakfast's owner, a little old lady by the name of Mabel, was trapped inside and burnt to death. Thank you, Mabel. I wish there were more people like you. When I was younger, I had an imaginary friend who lived in this massive antique dresser. We would just chill out and I vividly remember him telling me stories, although I have absolutely no recollection of what they actually were. I remember one day talking to my parents about it. My dad traveled quite a bit so he wasn't up to date with what I was into, and when I started telling him about my dresser buddy, he wanted to know his name. It was something innocent like Peter or Patrick, but I can still see him going white in the face. I drew Peter and Patrick out for him, and the very next day, him and my uncle took out the dresser and burned it. It wasn't until a few years later when I found out my dad's little brother, my uncle, also had the same friend with the same name who lived in the same antique dresser. After a few months of the typical imaginary friend shit, my uncle started having night terrors and couldn't sleep because of Peter. It got so bad that they had to move him out of his room before he managed to get back to normal. Let me, uh, let me answer some of the most common questions about this story. One, the dresser was an old, dark, wood ugly thing. As far as we know, it belonged to my great-great-grandfather who had always been into some weird shit, um, if family history is to be believed. Number two, dad never talked about what was actually in the dresser and he was the only one who believed his brother when they were kids. Their parents didn't really care because they thought kids were just being kids and who honestly believed in spooky ghosts back then must have been a shock that 30 years later his own son started having the same friend. Number three, my uncle's night terrors ended when they moved him to another room. The bedroom he was in with the dresser was converted into a little sitting room since it had some nice views. It remained relatively unlived in until dad moved our family into that home and that room became mine. Number four, I haven't seen my uncle in 14 years now. I don't really speak to him since he is on the other end of the world. I'm afraid to bring something like this up since I know he struggles with depression and alcoholism, so I would hate to add stuff to his plate. Number five, to everyone asking what he looked like, I remember a tiny old man. Not like old man tiny, but kid size tiny. He had very large hands, long fingers, which in turn led to how I draw people even today. Hands always come out longer and larger than what they would normally be. He smelled of wood, mothballs, old clothes, and what I know now is mold. It was near Halloween time when my friends and I were telling ghost stories. My friend said she was going to tell a story about her parents' first date. She said she didn't like telling the story since it was actually true, but we prodded her on. To cut to the chase, the parents had spent a nice, if awkward, first date. And around the time that they would have said goodnight, the male in the situation, my friend's dad, suggested they go for a midnight hike up Provo Canyon. He apparently knew the place since he had done a fair amount of rock climbing in the area. So the two drove up the mouth of the canyon, got out of their cars, and started hiking under just the light of the stars, since it was a new moon. At some point, the male starts getting a bad feeling, since the pathway ahead, which would pass under some trees, would be very dark, and because it was getting to be quite late. He ignores the feeling and presses on. In later rehearsings of the story, the female would say that she had felt the same feeling at what was probably the same time, though she didn't know the trail like he did. A minute later, the feeling came back to the male. He ignored it again and started walking a bit of the way into the trees when his foot hit something soft in the middle of the path. Under the trees, it was too dark to see what he just hit, and the feeling came back stronger than ever. Instead of finding out what his foot had bumped into, he and the female both agreed to hightail it out of there. Years later, after being married for some time, they were watching an interview with the serial killer, Ted Bundy. In response to a question asking him to describe the time that he felt the closest to being caught, he explained about the night that he lured a girl into Provo Canyon and had just killed her when he heard some people coming up the trail. He explained how he hid in the trees just in time only to watch some guy walk right into the body and for some reason just turn around and walk away.
A few years ago, my brother would get a call on his cell phone around 2 to 3 a.m. every night. He would answer it, and it was this hellish sounding noise, like static mixed with screams. He changed his cell number after a month of it, and it stopped. Then after a week or so, it began again. The exact same noise, exact same time. Finally, one day, he decided to backdial the call. It was an old man that had no clue what he was talking about. Still, the calls persisted. If he didn't answer, it would be a call a few more times. No messages were left. He decided to say screw it, ended his contract with his phone company and switched to a new one, and then got another new number. You guessed it, the screaming static calls continued after a short delay. By this time, he was terrified every night, unsure why this was happening. He backdialed the number again and got a different person. Around this time, he lost his job at his phone. The calls stopped, of course. His phone was disconnected for now, so one day my mom asks me to listen to this weird message she got on her phone. It was the static screaming. We showed my brother and he was freaking out. He backed out the number again and it said the number was disconnected this time. Never heard from it again after that. This happened to a friend of mine. She told me about it um, a year or so ago. We'll call her Minji. Minji is in her late 20s and works as an English tutor in South Korea. One evening a few years ago, she was tutoring a high school boy. They were up studying pretty late and the buses stopped running. Being a long way from his house, the boy asked if he could crash on her floor overnight and get the first bus the next morning. Minji was very reluctant because inviting a teenage male student to stay in the night didn't sound like a great idea, but he was begging her and eventually she relented. They went back to her one-room apartment and she got into the bed while he laid a blanket out on the floor and they both fell asleep. A few hours later, at maybe 2 a.m., the boy wakes Minji up. I'm really hungry, he says. Let's go get some food. Minji opens her eyes and looks up at him in disbelief. Food? Now? It's 2 a.m. Just go back to bed. But the student insists. No, I'm so hungry. Let's eat something now. She tells him that there's some ramen in the kitchen and he can fix himself some. This doesn't satisfy him. He doesn't want ramen. There's a 24-hour place just down the road. Let's go there. Eventually, after several minutes of persuasion, the boy gets Minji to come with him to the restaurant. They leave the apartment and head out. As soon as they're on the street, the boy turns to Minji and says, I'm not hungry. I woke up in the middle of the night and looked under your bed. There's a man sleeping there. They call the police and discover that a homeless man had been living in Minji's apartment, sleeping under her bed. For over two months, the boy only saw him because he was lying on her floor, so he had a clear view under the bed. The police arrested the man, and thankfully there were no other issues. But that's by far the creepiest thing that's ever happened to anyone I know. My friend and I were going to a party a few hours out of town, so we decided to stay at our family's holiday house about an hour south of the party. We arrived around mid-afternoon and it was winter in a holiday town so the area was completely empty, no other cars on the street. When we left for the party I spent a moment deciding whether to pull the gate all the way closed. I had some trouble opening it earlier when we arrived and if we were getting home late at night I didn't want to be stuck outside I decided to shut it for security. Party was great, we got back to the house around 12.30 and the gate was open. I immediately felt on edge because not only did I know I'd locked it but I knew it couldn't just blow open in the wind, but I didn't want to make a big deal so I was vague when my friend asked if I'd shut it. We went inside and decided to make a snack. I was wandering through the house when suddenly my friend raced from the kitchen into the hallway and virtually tackled me to the ground. She was convinced she'd heard someone walking around outside. We tried to calm ourselves down but we had no cell reception and there was no one else around. Over the next half hour or so, as we sat in the hallway, paralyzed with fear, we heard footsteps outside and the back door being jimmied. We decided we had to leave, so we gathered everything up and got ready to make a break for the car. Just as we were out the front door, ready to leave, there was a huge bang in the backyard and suddenly what sounded like hundreds of birds started screaming. We legged it to the car and ended up starting, starting it with our stuff still on our laps. We hadn't bothered to even put it in the back seat. As we reversed out the driveway, we saw somebody running up the side of the house towards us. We sped the entire way home, and even once, we got back to my place. We didn't sleep at all that night. When I was in 8th grade, I went on a school trip that was called the Louisiana Tour. 
it was mostly going around to significant sites in South Louisiana. One of the places we went was Myrtle's Plantation, which is considered to be one of the most haunted places in the country. There are all kinds of stories about this place, but at one point we were standing in a room as part of a larger group, and the tour guide was talking about something. I don't remember what. As I'm standing there, I start to hear what sounds like someone hitting a piano key. After I heard it a couple of times, I started to look around for the source of the noise. I didn't see a piano, but I kept hearing it, so I asked my friends who were standing near me if they heard it. They said no. When I heard it again, I said, there it is again, and they must have heard it. They thought I was crazy. So I went back to looking around the room. Everyone's eyes were on the tour guide except for one woman. She caught my eye and pointed at me and then at her ear with a questioning look. I realized she was asking if I heard it too and I nodded. At this point, the tour guide started telling a story about a soldier who had died there and that he played the piano and multiple guests had reported hearing him playing in the night. I honestly didn't know what to think. I guess I still don't. I talked to the woman as we were all leaving, and she said she heard the exact same thing as me, but her husband and son had not heard it.